So in one of my last videos, we rigged a door with constraints so that when we rotate the door, it rotates exactly as it should and is limited to a certain range. I promised I'd show you how to make this switch, which acts like a controller for the door. This switch uses a driver, which I admit is not an area I'm an expert in, which also involves a small amount of math. This entire Blender video, door and all, is available to Patreon subscribers who support me with just a few bucks a month. Real quick, I modeled a backplate for this switch by starting with a plane. In edit mode, I stretched it into the shape I wanted, I beveled the four edges, I did some insetting and extruding, and I even applied a plane material to it. Oh, I also added and applied a mirror modifier to make it look the same from front and back. And I chose Shade Auto Smooth to give it a nice clean look. The back plate can be as basic as you want though, a simple plane would work too. Next, I added a cylinder for the button. I rotated and moved it into the bottom position here. I made sure it passed through both sides of the back plate. It will eventually be restricted to about this range of motion. I gave the button a new and different material. In addition to making the material color red, we can go down to the bottom of the material settings and change the viewport display color to red as well. That way, the button is red even in solid mode. Then I added a new text object. To edit a text object, you hit tab. I have a whole video on text objects. I typed open, enter, and then close. With the text selected, I went to the text properties tab and I made some adjustments. Under the paragraph settings, I increased the line spacing to space out the two words vertically. Then in the geometry settings, I increased the extrude setting to make the text three-dimensional. I added another new material to the text. I made it a black material and again changed the viewport display color to be black. I also duplicated the text, rotated it 180 degrees, and positioned the second text on the back side so we can read it from both sides. Then I added that black material to the outside of the base plate as well. This is all just aesthetics. Next, I parented the button and both text objects to the back plate. You hold shift and select each object. Make sure the back plate is selected last so it's the active object and is outlined in yellow rather than orange. Press Ctrl P to parent the selected objects to the back plate. I have a whole video on parenting objects as well. Now let's work on restricting the button's movement so it can only go up and down a tiny bit. To make this a little easier, I'm going to move the button to its farthest bottom position next to the word close. It'll just be easier using positive numbers. It'll make sense when we get to the driver. Then select the object and if we press in to open the sidebar, we see the location of the object is not applied because we have numbers in these location values that are not zero. With the button selected, press Ctrl A and choose apply location. Now all the location values are zeroed out. To restrict this button's movement, let's go to the Constraints tab. When we made the door, we added a Limit Rotation constraint, but this time we will add a constraint and choose Limit Location. The button is only going to be allowed to move a tiny bit on the Z axis and not at all on the X and Y. So we can check the minimum X and minimum Y, as well as the maximum X and maximum Y, and just leave these as zero. If we do the same for the Z axis, it won't allow the button to move at all. But let me point something out here. When I click the button and press G and then move my mouse around, the button doesn't move. But look what's happening to its location settings. It's still changing, and if I release the button, that location is all messed up again. This causes a big problem for what we're about to do. It's incredibly frustrating, but here's what fixes it. Let's delete this limit location, reset the button's location, and again apply the location. Basically, let's start over. Now let's apply the limit location constraint. But before we do anything else, check this box for Affect Transform. For whatever reason, checking this box is what will make the button's location not get all screwed up when we move it beyond its limit. It took me a long time to figure that part out. Now with all the boxes checked, I grab the button and it doesn't move, but the location doesn't change either. So that's good. So this button is completely restricted now on all axes. But let's uncheck the maximum Z because we do want this button to be able to move up to the open position. Move the button up so it's as high as we want it to be able to go. I recommend clicking these arrows if you can to incrementally move the button up by round quantities. Later, it could make the math a little bit easier. In this case, I moved it up 0 0.08 meters. That's better than 0 0.07569 meters or something like that. Oh yeah, and come back to the constraint and change this owner from world space to local space. That will also be important later. Now hover over the Z location and just while you're hovering, press Control C to copy that value. Go to the maximum Z value on the constraint, hover over the value and press Control V to paste it. That's actually a pretty cool trick in itself to be able to copy and paste values like that. Let's check that maximum Z box. Now if we move this button by pressing G and moving our cursor in any direction, it will only go up and down within the range that we've set it up to. We've restricted all other movement of this object except 
that if we move the parent object, the back plate, the button will move with it as it should. If we had this constraint set to world space, it would still not move even though the parent object moved. That's why restricting it to its own local space and not the absolute world space is so important. So we've done everything except connect this switch to the door's rotation so that it can function as a controller. If you've made it this far, please give me a like on the video. It's super helpful and encourages me to keep doing this for free. To make it so the switch controls the rotation of the door, we will use a driver. In the previous video, which I hope you watched, but you may not have, we limited the door's rotation to the Z axis, and it can only rotate from between zero and 120 degrees. The door is parented to the door frame, and a pivot constraint keeps the door's pivot point at the hinge. Now we want the button in its closed position and the door in its closed position. Select the door and hover over the door's Z location in the sidebar. Right click and choose Add Driver. This intimidating window pops up with controls for the driver. If you click off this window, it disappears and that's annoying. We can right click on the now purple Z rotation. It turns purple to indicate it has a driver attached to it and choose Edit Drivers to reopen it. We can also choose Open Drivers Editor, which will open this screen with more options and the same driver info is over here on the right. But we want to make sure the driver is highlighted over here. It's called Z Euler Rotation, and it's the only one we have right now. Drivers are complex, and I'm still learning them, so there's a lot here. They're basically an equation that says, when this thing happens over here, for us it's the movement of the button, then it affects this thing over here, the rotation of the door, in a certain way. This driver is already placed on the Z rotation of the door, so that's what will be affected. We want it to be controlled by the Z location of the button. Down here is the first variable in the equation. We choose the object that is going to affect the object with the driver on it. Then we choose what transformation of that object will drive the rotation of this door. In our case, it's the Z location of the button. I believe we also want to have this operate in local space so it's not affected if we move the parent object. So let's see what happens right now. I'll minimize the second window because as a second window, we can easily reopen this. If we move the button upwards, we see it is actually pushing the door open, but only a tiny bit. We can't open the door more than this much. Let's go back to the driver window that's already open. We need to reselect the door and make sure we have our driver selected over here again. See this expression? This is saying that the rotation of the door is going to equal this variable, the location of the button, plus zero. Well, that's just not enough. Let's instead change this equation to be var, B-A-R, which means the location of the button, and use an asterisk to multiply this amount. And let's try to multiply it by 10. Now, when we move the button up, the door moves much more than it did. 10 times more as a matter of fact, but it's still not enough. That's as far as I can open the door. Back to the driver and select the door again. Let's try to multiply the value by 15 instead. This is better, but I want a little more. Back to the driver and we will multiply it by 20. I'm sure there's a mathematical way to be a little more precise here, but I'm just doing trial and error. That is just about perfect, but we can play around with this value for finer adjustments. If you're experiencing issues with this process, there are plenty of things that could be causing it. You may have the rotation inverted, in which case you'd want to multiply by a negative number, I think. You may not have applied the rotation and location correctly. There's probably a lot more things it can be. But if you got any value out of this, please like, subscribe, and share. Oh my God, if somebody shares this, that would be so cool. Patreon is three bucks a month to support the channel, and you get some cool perks like the project file for this door and button. Take care and stay creative.